So I'm pleased to present our keynote speaker this morning, who is Martin Wildberger. He's from IBM. So without further ado, Martin. Great. Perfect. All right, so quick intro. I'm uh, Martin Wildberger. I have the uh, pleasure of heading up uh, IBM's Information Management Development Organization, which is about a $6 billion business. I've got about 4,500 folks around the world. And one of the key topics that we talk about a lot these days is the power of big data. So one of the key things that I think that we all have an opportunity to do is to look at the world in terms of perspective of what happens when you have unlimited access to data, when you have unlimited compute capacity, and you have this you know, you know, power of analytics. And so you know, if you think about the world that we're approaching today, we're very much approaching this world where the power of yesterday's mainframes or the power that we're sitting on our you know, cell phones. So we truly have this ability to be able to say, how do we now drive this ubiquitous world of, of, of driving these new possibilities? And so, you know, a lot of people refer to this as this next era of computing. You know, how the world is going to change as you now have this unlimited compute capacity that has this unlimited access to data. What's going to be the power of social media? How do I bring all this data together? And one of the things that a lot of people are continually sort of figuring out is, you know, we've heard a lot about data. Yesterday in, the, in, in a number of the keynotes, uh, you guys heard about the power of data. Um, that, you know, sensor technologies, you got all this new online data. And to think about it, I've always looked at data. Some people sort of look at data as this thing that says, you know, I'm wrestling with having too much data. You know, I look at data as a piece of the puzzle. And as we were kids, we all learned that the more pieces of the puzzle you have, the clearer the picture you have. And so one of the things that we can look at now in our business processes is how are we going to transform the world with all of this new insight? And this new insight is going to be coming from social media. It's going to be coming from all these traditional you know, you know, you know, transactional-based systems as well as all of this new unstructured data that's coming online, whether it's sensor technology, whether or not it's going to be social media technology, whether or not it's going to be now video feeds. And you can do amazingly new things with this data. So, you know, and it's, it's neat to be able to unlock the imagination of what can you do with this technology. You know, so for example, I'm going to give you a number of, of case studies to sort of you know, spurn the imagination of what people are doing with this technology. But you start looking at things like if you're a railroad company, and Marie and I were talking about some of the stuff that we're doing with CN and, and, and CP Rail and Company, people are starting to now monitor the vibration of the wheels so that as you, a train is grinding down the tracks, if you are measuring the vibration of the wheel, you can actually detect instability in the track. So therefore, you can now do preventative maintenance on your railroad tracks as you are driving. Similarly, you know, you start looking at all of this new sensor technology. We're putting, you know, we're putting sensors inside bridges so that you can actually now be able to figure out, can I now detect instability in the bridges before an anomaly happens? We all are, you know, seeing the benefit of what happens with, when we deal with companies that have understanding of a better insight of who I am. You know, you know, I want to have a better level of service. And one of my favorite expressions is, you know, and I'm about to, you know, run from here over to the Air Canada airport. And those of you that are frequent flyers, quick show of hands. You know, Air Canada, have you ever been in a place that has a slower elevators than the Air Canada Centre? If you go into the Air Canada lounge, you are, you are in the slowest elevators in the world. If you are a frequent flyer, you live by a, a couple of rules. You never check in your bags. So therefore, you are dragging your bag. You know, and the first thing you do is you can, you're in a hurry. So you can look forward to the long line where you have to reach into your wallet, get out the stupid card, so that you can identify yourself to say, listen, I'm somebody important to you. What's wrong with having the ability for, again, technology to be able to say, I want to self-identify myself. In this application right now, this is an opportunity where I wanted you to know who I am. So when I get off the elevator, it says, you know, good afternoon, Mr. Walberger, your flight's on time, you're leaving from uh, gate number XYZ, have a good time, zoom right by the line. You know, there's an, you know, all of this technology, this information, this insight is available for us to exploit. And this is all about, you know, one of the key things. And when we start thinking about big data, there's a lot of definitions of what's big data. A lot of people associate big data with Hadoop, you know, with things. It's really important. And I think we, yesterday we talked about the three Vs in terms of this new variety, velocity, and volume of data. But it's really the, 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 the fact that these three things are coming together. You have this unlimited new access to data. You have this new technology. You've got streaming technology. You've got a new, I mean, MapReduce, at the end of the day, it's got some cool file systems that's a distributed file system capability. And at the same point in time, you have a new computational model that you can do parallel processing very more, more effectively. So that whole process of being able to do streaming computing, new computational models, unlimited access to you know, cheap storage, you know, the ability to do you know, real-time data processing, it's allowing us to process this unlimited data in new ways. But it's all motivated by driving what are the new business outcomes. What can I do today that I couldn't do before? 
And, you know, what we've tried to do inside IBM is we're trying to figure out, you know, what are all the kind of use cases that people are, you know, motivated to drive. And I'm going to go into each one of these in a little bit more detail. But the point is, is that we have compelling reasons to act. There are all kinds of reasons of why we want to get into access to all this data. You have all of this ability to say, listen, you've got improper payments. You've got all kinds of inefficiencies. You've got cyber crime. You've got all kinds of opportunities. So you both, you both have sort of a risk perspective that says, I need to be able to take advantage of all this new insight to do things differently. Yet at the same point in time, how do I now take advantage of this data to do new things? How many of you are familiar with IBM's Data Baby? So those of you that haven't, Google Data Baby. It's a cool, it's a little clip. It's a, if, if, you're, if you're in Toronto, how many of you have a base here in Toronto? Yeah, well, a number. You know, but it's, it's a project that we did with the University of Ontario with the Toronto Hussock Kids. And it's a, an application of looking at how we can do instrumentation of babies coming out of the neonatal ward so that you can detect infection disease earlier. Can you now take all of this new data? Can you process it in real time? And can you understand patterns so that you can take preventative action earlier? And by doing so, not only do you save lives, but you have the opportunity to be much more efficient with your, with your, with, with, with your healthcare dollars. So you start looking at all of the things that, you know, you know, whether you're in healthcare, whether or not you're an insurance company, whether or not you're a retailer, you're trying to figure out how do I take advantage of all of this new insight so I can now be able to exploit this capability in real time. So it's the opportunity that I've got this unlimited new potential to be able to do new things, and what can I do with it? And so the key thing that I wanted to do today is to go through a couple of these examples. So we've looked at sort of these, you know, we, we've been involved in over 300 big data deployments to, you know, to date, uh, and we're sort of organizing them around these logical, you know, five areas. One around big data exploration, a lot of discussions around the 360 degree view of the, of the client, a lot of security intelligence extensions, operational analysis and data warehouse augmentation. And I thought one of the best ways of teaching you some of the power of how this technology is coming together is to walk you through a number of use cases where you can sort of see an imagination so that you will both spawn your imagination of what's possible, but understand a little bit about the technology and some of the issues you need to do, be able to wrestle with. So the key point is that across all of those applications, there's not an industry in the world that's not going to be affected by this next era of computing. I don't care where you are. You can give me any industry. You can, you know, whether you're an oil company and oil exploration, whether or not you're a hospital, whether or not you're a retailer, you want to be able to take advantage. And I will just go back to all of us. If we can just play back the clock. How many, and I'm, I'm sure every one of you has had some experience where you have been frustrated because people haven't taken advantage of the insight you think they should know about you. It started when we were into e-commerce. Remember back in 96 when internet was first coming on board? What did we know about those companies? You know, we found very quickly, those of us, especially on the IT side of the house, it's one of the things I love to do, is I always love to look at the external user experience I'm having and try to understand something about the IT infrastructure that that company has behind the scenes to say, you know, how were they organized to get me this user experience? And all of us started to realize the pain when we first got shopping into internet access. You know, there was a lot of companies we would be dealing with where you'd go into your favorite bookstore and you'd say, you know, the experience I'm having in the store is not nearly as pleasant as the experience I'm having online. I can find things a lot faster and the poor person that I'm, I'm talking to inside the store hasn't got a clue. And you, at some point in time, you know, if you're impatient like I am, you probably almost wanted to say, listen, it's okay. Just point me to where the internet terminal is in your store is and I'll serve myself. And then at some point in time, you started realizing, well, hold it. You got sucked into all these loyalty programs. You got all of these neat things. And all of a sudden, you realize, oh, this is no good. You know, the money that I just spent online, they don't recognize in the store. You know, and then all of a sudden, multi-channel retailing came about. And all of a sudden, we said, of course, it's the right answer. You know, I can buy something on the web. I should be able to return it in the store. I should be able to self-identify myself. I should be able to take advantage of all of this area so that I can get a better customer service. You know, and the neat thing is, is once you get that experience in one part of your industry, one part of your interactions, you have absolutely zero patience for companies that don't give you that experience in others. The one that I love is all of us, I'm, I'm sure, have experienced where you understand very quickly when you're dealing with a company that has a customer-centric view versus a policy-centric view. My favorite example all the time is my insurance company. 
for the, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll leave the name off the table for a sec, but I'm sure some of you will smile and recognize it. How many of you, you know, at Christmas time, look forward to getting your, you know, the beautiful Christmas card from, you know, your insurance company? And then the next day, you say, if you're especially like me, you where you don't go to the mailbox every day, you know, you go there three days later and you get four more of the same Christmas cards. Nicely handwritten, nicely signed. And then suddenly you realize that this poor company, it deals with me as a, on a policy basis, which at what point in time you very quickly say, I'm getting frustrated because I'm paying for this inefficiency. So exactly the opposite sentiment that they wanted to drive in terms of instead of making you feel better by saying thanking you for your business, you're starting to see some of the inefficiencies because they are not treating you from a sort of a customer centric view and integrating all of their data. And that's one of the key powers that what big data allows us to do is to start figuring out how we can do these new you know, environments better. So this new use case around big data exploration, one of the key things that big data is also allowing us to do, if we think about the traditional way we've done analytics, we always had questions that we know we needed to answer. We went to our IT shops and said, listen, this is the, date, this is the question I need to have answered. What's all the data I need to be able to do to be able to process that? And it was sort of from that top-down perspective. One of the beauties of big data is it allows you to start exploring. You know, you're starting to look up for things that you don't actually know what you're looking for because you have new visualization technologies. You have all this ability to be able to say, listen, I just want to sort of experiment about what can this thing tell me. There's another key phenomenon. Again, you know, if you think about what's making big data real, we talked about all this new data, these three Vs and the volume, velocity, and variety of the data. But there's also this technology. And one of the biggest elements of this technology is its speed and its real-time processing capability. And because of that, you are able to iterate much faster. And so you could just now put yourself in the perspective of an explorer, a data explorer. You're trying to figure out some questions. You fundamentally approach a problem differently. If you know that I'm going to ask a question, 24 hours I'm going to come back and they'll give me an answer. Versus I can ask a question and in three minutes... I can get a coffee, I can even turn. I want it instantaneously. You start approaching the way you actually attack that problem differently. You get more efficient. You'd be able to get look at wider areas of boundaries so that you can be more efficient. And this is exactly the type of technology that you know, some of the medical institutions are starting to use. Things that used to take 27 hours to be able to do all these different simulations, they can now do in minutes. That, that's allowing them to not only process things faster, but it's allowing them to approach the problem differently because they now have all this ability to be able to manage all that data more effectively. You start looking at some, and guys like you know, Eli Tahari. You know, hopefully many of you know this as a, one of the leading retailers based in, out in New York. They pride themselves on understanding 360 degree of the customer. They're maniacally focused on trying to figure out how can I now take all of this real-time inventory management, all this real-time you know, data processing, so that I can actually predict. And one of the, one of the stats that they're incredibly proud of, they can predict 97% accuracy of what their customer orders are going to be four months ahead of when the transaction takes place. You know, one of the things that people are also starting to find, it's, it's always fun for me to watch how evolutions in technology evolve, where you can start thinking, remember how we first interfaced with the internet? You know, you started thinking, okay, I'm going to buy something on the internet. The first thing you do is you immediately say, okay, well, hold it. What do other people tell me? You know, I'm going to look for a car. I'm looking for this new Audi car or I'm looking for a new restaurant. You know, what's been the reviews? And then, you know, when it was in its naive stage, most of the feedback you got was honest feedback. But as soon as people, it's sort of like the game that gets done between the hackers and the, and, and, and the fraud detectors. There's always this race going back and forth. And so very quickly, what we all figured out was that, you know, for $1,000, there are companies today where you can give your company a you know, URL address and they, will, they have a network around the world that will give you, you know, 1,000, 10,000. How many positive feedbacks do you want to have for money? So now what they've done is that all this new data is they've polluted that value. But we're smart. We realize very quickly, well, hold on. I don't really care what the masses think. I care about what my network thinks. So that's one of the reasons why, you know, companies like LinkedIn and all that, you know, good stuff where we are all associating ourselves with networks. Here is my trusted group because I don't care what the masses think because I no longer trust what the masses think. I want to understand who my, what my network is saying about this experience. And that's going to be much more valuable. And so before you know it, one of the key things that we're all doing is we're building our reputation online. 
and people will start using our reputation. eBay is a great example of this, right? You know, you, every time you do a buying transaction, you understand something about who the seller is and who the buyer is, and you have a view of saying, can I trust that individual? And one of the things that, you know, I have a, you know, a beautiful 15-year-old son, and I'm, I'm trying to teach him very strongly that says things that we all learned in kindergarten. You know, you say 10 smart things, and you say one stupid thing, people remember you for the stupid thing. You know, you do, you know, 10 good things and you do one bad thing, people remember you for the bad thing. So your reputation that you're building is critical. And as we go into this world of new, you know, uh, uh, you know big data, this notion of reputation, this notion of privacy, this notion of ethics t- plays a critical role because we as individuals want to have choice. When I give a company some data, I want to understand how they're using that data. And I'm hoping that if they haven't explicitly given me that information, that they are managed by some ethical laws that says, I know what they're going to do with it. And when I find out that they have violated that, I'm no longer going to be dealing with those guys. So you have an opportunity to be able to look at all these different areas, around 360 degrees. This is one of the biggest applications people are doing is all around churn management. How can I find out what people are doing? So Uform is one of the largest telcos in Pakistan. You know, they are maniacally focused on, you know, can I start processing all the CDR records in real time so I can have a better insight of what my companies are going to do, what my customers are going to do, you know, who are the valued contributors, who when some individual moves, the, you know, their network of individuals will move with them. <clears throat> this is all about how do I gain better insight by doing so. And by doing that, I can figure out how do I avoid one of the big issues that everybody has, which is the churn you know, disruption that takes place. You know, you start looking at Bass Pro. Bass Pro is a great example of one of our local companies here in the U.S. and in Canada, you know, that is, again, maniacally focused on trying to change that user experience. How can I know something more about you? And this is what I fundamentally believe, that once you understand and you have one of these beautiful experiences, it sets the bar for all the new experiences that you're going to be interacting with. And it's all about how do I process all this data and how do I take advantage of it so that I can figure out which data is relevant to me. How do I make sure that I take advantage of that using all this new technology to drive the right business outcome? So as you're approaching, one of the key messages takeaways here is, yes, the data is here. Yes, the technology is here. But the viability of where we're going to go in this big data space will always start with the business problem. Are we driving the right business problem that's going to drive, you know, what data do I need? So if you think about it, the very systematic way you look for is you first start with the business problem. Once I have the business problem, then you look at it and say, okay, what's the data that I need to be able to solve that business problem? And people will iterate over the data. People will say, well, hold it, here's data, you know, you know, set one, data set two, data set three. And suddenly you'll realize, oh my God, there's this new data set that if I take advantage of that, I can extrapolate and get a much greater insight on where the industry is going. And then the third aspect is all the algorithms. How can I process, you know, next generation algorithms over the data so I can now figure out how do I more effectively understand what I want to do? And one of the things that we are doing inside research today is we have this new technology that we call taste analytics where we can actually, because one of the cool things that people are trying to figure out is what you say and what you do are two different things. There are a lot of people on the internet that say certain things, that act certain things, that on their Twitter streams, on their Facebooks, whatever it may well be, and it's actually not representative of what actions they will take. The cool news is, is that there's been, you know, you know hundreds of years of you know, psychological research where people understand how to actually characterize people's behaviors. And once you can actually classify their behavior, you can have a better understanding of a prediction model of what they're actually going to do. So now you have this new next generation technology that can actually look at all these data sets and figure out not only what they are saying, but what they actually believe. And by understanding how they believe, you can more effectively interact with them. And again, it's going to be all around a perspective of, do I want to have that choice? Because, you know, ultimately, you, you want the individual to have control. So, you know, operational analytics, I think, is one of the most exciting ones that's taking place. It's this machine analytics that we talked about. You know, all of this new areas of, of how do I take advantage of this instrumentation. I told you about, the, you know, the bridges, the railroad cars, the trains. You know, one of the cool examples is, is, is just traffic. You know, today, you know, you, you know and this, you, you can look at this, you know, you can look at your CDR records. You can look at your call data records. You know, you know any you know, telco has this data today where you can say, I, I don't even, I don't need to know who you are. I just need to know that you're sitting, you know, at King and Dundas right now and there's a thousand other people that are sitting there with you and you've got a traffic jam going on. 
You know, so there's, there's, there's a degree of anonymity of data that allows me to process. And then at the same point in time, there's all kinds of now explicit data that you're giving them. You're giving them data because you now have transponders in your cars. When you travel on areas, you're going to now get different services based on where you are so that you now have an opportunity to be able to change your behavior as a government, as a railroad, to be able to say, how do I more effectively understand where we need to go? You know, and so this is one of the key things Dublin has done. This is, you know, Dublin is one of these congested cities, and they sort of figured out, you know, how can I now you know, go into the 21st century and provide a value-add service? Why shouldn't I be able to have instant messaging on my phone to tell me where my bus route is? I shouldn't have to look out where the bus is. I should be able to know a complete visibility of where you know, you know, my, the, uh, the public transportation system is. And at the same point in time, the public transportation system should be, have a complete visibility of where you as a consumer are so I can now dynamically change my route. One of my favorite examples of machine data <coughs> is the FedEx UPS I- I- example. How many of you have had a broken phone you know, where you need you know, a phone replaced and the guy says, no problem, we're going to deliver that phone to you at your home? You know, all the time, right? And then how many times, so you say, okay, no problem, I'm going to change all my logistics, I'm going to change my environment, I'm going to stay home. And then and invariably somehow, you know, you, you go to the front door like two hours later and you've got a little sticky label on your front door that says, sorry, we missed you. And you go, well, what, what do you mean you missed you? I was here. <clears throat> At that point in time, you know, you're, you're kind of toast. But my point is, wouldn't it be great if I could just instant message the guy and say, listen, where are you? You're probably still in my neighborhood. I'll get in my car if need be, and I'll meet you at the Tim Hortons down the street where I know you're going to be in two minutes, and I'll pick up it then. There's all kinds of different behavior you could have to have that service. One of the other great examples I always love is what happens when your flight gets canceled. You're in, you're in Boston. The snowstorm's coming. Your flight just gets canceled. What does invariably everybody have to do today? They invariably wait in front of some stupid line that's 200 people long, where you're trying to get service by some you know, poor individual. And if you had you know, the, the place machine data networked so that you could now understand you've registered yourself, they know who you are. You know, one of the favorite examples I was just last week, you know, I landed in Boston, I went to the Hertz, and I'm uh, you know, a Hertz number one guy, and I show there, my name's no longer on the board. And I have to wait in line, drives me nuts. And I go to the guy and I says, I don't understand why my name's not there. And the guy sort of explains to me that, well, your, your flight was late. So I said, well, so let me get this straight. My plane's delayed an hour. So when I need your service of getting in and out of the airport the most, you unfortunately, business laws, because you didn't have visibility, the data wasn't connected. Your data that knew that my flight was in was not tied to the data of your reservation system. So you went to the business process. Your business models changed so that you took my name off the board so I now can wait in line. Instead of saying, boy, this is the time I need this guy to be out even faster because we know all this data. This is where we can take advantage of all this machine data. We have all this insight. So this data warehouse augmentation model is, is one of the key models that we're talking about in terms of how can you use this new model to be able to say, you know, I can use this as a landing zone. I can use all this Hadoop you know, infrastructure, this unstructured world to say, listen, this is sort of a bottomless pit of, of data, and I can use it as a temporary landing zone. So I can now sit in an augmentation between what I'm doing in my structured world and in my unstructured world and have the ability to figure out how do I now take advantage of that data to be able to process it more effectively. So you have all of these different opportunities to be able to do you know, processing of data in real time in different environments that you ever had. And probably one of the most you know, exciting in my last example I'll take you through is you know, the security and intelligence. You know, whether or not you, know, you are in fraud detection, you know, insurance companies, banks, you, know, you, you name it, are trying to look at all of this data to take advantage of this data to be able to figure out what are the patterns that will detect when fraud is taking place. You know, they have the ability to have all this different insight. If I can integrate it, so my point is every interaction is a piece of the puzzle. If I've now collected these pieces of the puzzles effectively and brought them together, I can completely change a buying experience. I can completely change a business model. I can more effectively manage an outcome. That's one of the promises that we have in terms of being able to integrate this data. So part of the key infrastructure is, yes, you've got all this new data. Yes, you've got all this new processing capabilities to do it with. But how do I take advantage of it to do any things? And my last example will be the Terra Ecos one, which I think is a real great example of, again, you know, talking about in real time. These guys are processing 47 terabytes of data in real time streaming data a day. Video technology, audio technology, real time auto processing. You know, this is some of the stuff that the government is taking you know, you know, great advantage of. They want to be able to understand and have visibility 
in real time of events that before we were never able to process. So again, it goes back to all the things where we started at the very beginning. You know, this is, we, you know, we're on this new era of computing that's opening up all these opportunities. You know, you've got unlimited access to data, you've got unlimited access to communicate capability, and it's opening up a whole new world of business processes. And the key area, from my perspective, is, you know, think big and think bold. Because from my perspective, you have an opportunity that this will truly transform the way we interact in the world, and it's opening up all kinds of new opportunities. And it's unfortunate that I only have a half an hour to chat with you on this topic, but I'm going to open it up now to a couple of Q&As.